point that the Premier made, which is about collaboration. I love that video. It shows why we want to collaborate with the Australian Navy and with Australia in general, because I'd love to come, go down there and be able to, uh, to work together once again uh, with uh, the, the Australian forces, as I have numerous times throughout my career. The ambassador talked about that. I personally started working with the Australian Navy in 1981 and have pretty much never stopped. And have had the delightful honor to be able to work with Steve Woodall, uh, to work with the likes of Jerry Christian and others in the war fighting theater in off the, uh, the Middle East. So I know who I can trust. When we talk about shipmates in the Navy, shipmates means that you trust each other with your lives. And I've trusted fellow warriors out there, Australians, with my life, and I believe they've trusted theirs with mine. Uh, so it is a great honor to work with the Australian Navy, and I hope that this collaboration, which is deep and long, is also very enduring over the years to come. And I think you'll see that there's plenty of reason why we should. Good, okay, you got it. The other thing I, I'd like to say is that I think part of that is because it's in our national psyches for both nations. That is, that I think both nations are, are never satisfied with where the frontier is. We're always looking for where that next frontier is. So again, it's no surprise that as we work together on these things, we are going to explore together where those frontiers can go. And uh, with that, here's our frontier. This is what we found our challenge really is. I thought it was all about technology when I started into the energy business on this. But what I found out is it's not. It's a lot more than technology. It's also about the culture. It's about changing the way people think about their use of energy. But how you can couple that with the, uh, the technology changes, whether it be for the existing fleet efficiencies and trying to figure out how to, how to enable the technologies in new ways, how to fundamentally change what we acquire for the future so that what we acquire for the future truly is much more, much more energy efficient. And at the end of the day, so that we're not entirely relying on one source of fuel and frankly held hostage to one source that comes from a very restricted number of places. So at the end of the day, we can become an energy smart navy, and that in turn begets an energy smart nation. And that what we're going to, the way we're going to do that is to be like the Spartan Navy. A lot of people don't remember that Sparta actually had a navy, won the second Peloponnesian War against the Athenians, who were great also mariners as well. So that's what we're trying to, to inculcate and all of our, our sailors today. And I was just on board the Bon Armour Shard uh, yesterday to uh, out there and see with them because they get it. And it's in their blood, it's in their DNA. Next slide. That's what I like. So where are we going on culture change? Well, this is kind of where we're starting. We're actually going and changing the way we educate people about energy. Naval Post Graduate School has actually started new programs in master's degree programs in energy so that our people can get really smart in energy, smarter than I am in energy and then bring that back. And then educating senior executives and flag officers in the Navy to be able to bring that back to every facet of what we do, whether it's planes, whether it's ships, whether it's tactical vehicles. We're actually changing how we incentivize things. It says there's energy E. What's an energy E? It's a battle efficiency E. We award ships that are the best in what they do with an E. That, that, they wear it on their chest. Well, I wear three of them right here. I'm proud of every single one I ever earned throughout my career. It means you were the best ship in your class in terms of battle readiness. Energy is going to be a part of that. Yeah. Fundamental change. As well, uh, we have uh, new programs in aviation, aviation NCON energy conservation programs. Uh, I, I bet if you ask any naval aviator in any Navy or Air Force, they'd probably say, I love using gas and I love using a lot of it because it means I'm flying. And that's a great thing in their book. But the real key is we've got to learn how to use a lot less of it. And that's actually changing the culture and incentivizing. We've been doing that in the surface Navy for a long time. That's in the maritime side. We're working with MIT, and we're working with Stanford University. And as I saw the slide go up there, the premier had of all the universities, I'd love to be able to work with some of the Australian universities as well, because I know that there's a lot of great knowledge out there that we could benefit from and vice versa. Uh, and then finally, expeditionary side, uh, we're actually sending our SEALs. The ambassador mentioned about the SEALs in their 50th uh, year they've been uh, out there, well, they have a fundamental new challenge for themselves, which is to be able to deploy as close to, to energy and water net zero as they humanly can. Think about that, to be able to go out essentially 
unsustained other than bullets and beans, everything else they pretty much bring in on their own. That's a big challenge, but that's where they're going. That's the changes that we're embarking on. Next slide. What we are also trying to do is we also have to do our part back there in Washington, which is to support it with money. $3.8 billion over the next five years in energy investments. Most of that, about 90% of it, is actually in terms of efficiency things because the, the barrel of fuel that you save or the MBTU that you don't consume on the shore side of the house, you save forever. But in addition to that, it gives you combat capability. And I think about that every single day for every decision that we make to enhance our combat capability. And efficiency gives us that. Then another 10% gets us into other things, and that's the, the alternative energy piece. But as you can see, we're trying to cover strategic value and risk with all sorts of different investments in little places, some of which pay out within a year, some that take two or three years, some that take maybe 10 years. But they do have a return on investment, ultimately, for the Navy, for our taxpayers. Next slide. And as you can see, a lot of them are actually retooling the fleet that's already out there. Most of the ships, most of the planes are going to be the same ones that are out there for the next 20 or 30 years. So we've got to be able to make them more efficient than they were in the past. But we have to invest in some new science and technology, and the new things we acquire in the future have to be fundamentally different and much more energy efficient. I'll show you what we're doing there. But it's, the key is finding the knee in the curve, the right investment point that gets you the maximum amount out of that as you measure it in terms of the number of barrels of fuel that you save from a tactical perspective. Next slide. On the acquisition side, in June of this past year, uh, our, our secretary that does research and development signed out a memo that said, thou shalt, thou, thou wilt, actually everything that you buy will have to be energy efficient. Have to be, mandatorily. And that has fundamentally started to change a lot of things. What's also changed is major procurement programs. Ohio Replacement Submarine is now has a key success attribute into it, and so the industry, as they see these things come out, are going to see these things show up in the contract language that it better be energy efficient. And you'll win contracts based upon whether or not you actually meet that. LSD, it's our landing ship, the next generation of small deck amphibious ship, also going to be energy efficient. The replacement oilers, the TAOX, an example of it shown there, a key success attribute, also energy efficient. And we've stood up an energy and acquisition team across the entire Navy to ensure that we drive that home in everything that we buy for the future. Next slide. Let's talk about alternative fuels, because that, when everyone thinks about Green Navy and you know, where are we going, they immediately think about alternative fuels. Well, alternative fuels, the alternative fuels are kind of listed up there, HRJ5, HRD76. That's an equivalent, it's a hydro renewable JP5. The HRD-76 is what we put into most of our ships. Bottom line is, over the past couple of years, since basically April of 2010, that was Earth Day. And that was, you know, there's a, a reason why we chose that day, but it also happened to work out that, that the aircraft was ready to do. Uh, but bottom line was, is what we've been doing is testing out every kind of engine that we have not so that we test out or certify each individual platform, but so that we certify the fuels. Once we run them, and I'll tell you, for instance, for the Green Hornet that we took out there and, and ran around, we did over a dozen tests. And a dozen tests of it from the maximum altitude to low levels to the maximum speed to slow speed to almost stall out. And then when we landed after the 12th one, we tore the entire engine apart to look and make sure that that engine was going to continue to function and function well. What we found along the way, the operators, and I was actually in the jump seat on the RCBX, and I can tell you, it went as fast on the biofuel as it would ever go on any other kind of petroleum. And when I asked the coxswain who has been driving those kind of boats for two decades, actually he started driving when he was on active duty back in Vietnam on those kind of boats, not quite those boats, but the predecessors to him, he said, I didn't notice the difference. And that was exactly the same comment that was heard by the pilots uh, from the experimental squadron at Pax River when they flew the Super Hornet. Same comments from the Blue Angels and Labor Day of this past year. Could notice it, and they are our best pilots. Everyone in the test pilot. So as you can see, again, we're complete. 